And before Pastor Shane comes, I have the privilege of sharing John. Our core values that we've been sharing with you, um, just as a reminder, over the past year, the Pine Grove elders have been working on this process called Rooted to Grow to basically reaffirm who we are and where we're headed as a church. Uh, through surveys and conversations and meetings, we've developed a mission statement and a set of core values for our church, many of which look very familiar to those of you who have been here for a while. And we're now in the process of sharing those with you. The purpose of Rooted to Grow is to create a unified direction and set of values to guide the future of the church's ministry that can be articulated by any member of our church. These core values describe why we do things as a church in our ministries and in our personal lives. They are the big ideas that drive our service to God and how we live in our personal lives as Christ followers. Other important values were identified during the process, but really most of them fall under some of the listed core values. And we hope and pray that you find this unifying and a good reminder of our purpose and calling as God's family at Pine Grove. The core value we're going to focus on this week is connected in Christ-centered community. Christ-centered community is essential for spiritual growth. We are committed to building deep, genuine, intentional relationships to share our faith, grow our faith, and practice our faith. We want Pine Grove to be distinguished by how we know and love one another beyond our programs. So Christ-centered uh, community or fellowship is that loving others piece of our mission statement. And that just might be the hardest part of the mission statement and maybe the messiest part of the mission statement, as we all know. Um, some of these, uh, some of this, some of, some of this connectedness will take place in our church ministries, uh, like Connect Time and community groups, and of course, our beloved fellowship meals. Uh, but most of it will take place really as we do life together, intentionally building relationships with each other and being there for each other through all of life's ups and downs. This is one of the great responsibilities and blessings that we have as members of God's family. Now, over the past 18 months, we've been reminded of a couple things that relate to this. One, we really need Christ-centered community. And we miss it when we don't have it. Facebook and FaceTime only go so far and there are no replacement for face-to-face. -face. So, for those of you watching this online today, we miss you, and we look forward to having you back here with us as part of the congregation so that we can all reconnect in christ Center community. We hope you will all join us in what God has called us to do as his people here at Pine Grove Church, in God's mission of redemption as he calls us to love God, love others, and make authentic followers of Christ. And now Shane's going to share more on this. Thanks. And you mentioned Facebook. Uh, Facebook had a, they had a bad week this week. I don't know if you read or heard about it. Last week, the Wall Street Journal came out with a, actually a number of articles, an expose based on some uh, whistleblower documents that were sent to them, kind of detailing how Facebook knew all along the kind of damage they were doing to our society and the damage they were doing to individuals as people continually became addicted to the social media platform. Then on Sunday night, 60 Minutes interviewed this whistleblower and got huge ratings because it was after the Patriots game. Well, it didn't go, the Patriots game didn't go well, but the, the 60 Minutes interview had a huge number of viewership. And then the next day, Facebook had some kind of cyber attack and the site went down, the app went down, and it was out for five hours. And you're thinking, five hours? Who can That was the longest they've ever been on and catastrophic for a 24-7 uh, social media platform with billions of people around, or billion, point, one point, whatever it is, billion people around the world using it. And you know, there's a lot of things I could say this morning about those leaked documents or what we learned about the internal workings of Facebook or social media in general or our addictedness to sometimes to our devices or to our media. But there was a question that stuck with me through all of this. And the question was, why? Why was Facebook so successful? 
Why is it so big? Why has it played such a huge part in our society? Why does it have such strong effects on people, uh, even if some of those effects are very negative? And as I was thinking about what Facebook was and thinking about all the research I did during our, our series, Don't Panic, where I did a kind of deep dive into what is happening in social media, I remembered one thing that kept popping up over and over again. Why social media is so much different from everything else. Why it's so much more addictive than everything else. Why it's impacted people's lives, the people who use it anyway, so much more than other forms of media is because there is feedback from other people. You post something on Facebook, people could mark it and like it. They could share it. They could write a little comment. And what it creates is this kind of, well, community. It's a hollow community. It's a false community. People say things online they would never say in person, but yet it still kind of pulls at something in us, that, that need that we have for community, which is why it's wonderful for me to share pictures of my kids and why also some people have struggled with social media, that people who use more social media become more depressed that people say with eating disorders, that was one of the things that came out in this expose, all or a huge percentage of them reported their eating disorder getting worse the more social media they used. It creates this false sense of community for us, but because it's false, it leaves us empty at the end of the day. But I think Facebook's success points something out to us that we need community. It is programmed and designed into us. And that if we want to be a people who are walking with God, we have to not just have a hollowed out version of community in our lives, but something robust and meaningful. And so today we want to talk about how to live out community the way God intended. How to live out community the way God intended. We're going to see that in Hebrews chapter 10. So you could open up there. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 comes uh, towards the end of your uh, New Testament there. And here's how we're going to approach it this morning. We're going to look at the reason, the reason for the importance of community, what it looks to live out Christ-centered community, and then some application of how we want to work that out here, some of which uh, has already been alluded to by, by Bruce explaining our core value. All right, Hebrews chapter 10. Let me start reading uh, in verse 19, and then I'll give some background here. All right, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed pure with water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Okay, I haven't actually gotten to the community part yet, but I wanted to read that context because it's important for understanding the book of Hebrews. Why is this author encouraging these people to cling to Christ, to hold fast the confession of their faith, to remind them you've been washed clean in and out because of the blood of Jesus Christ, that all who believe in Jesus and his death on a cross and resurrection from the dead have forgiveness of their sins and can turn away from sinful life and the brokenness of this world and turn to God, both to give them a new life and a transformed life to live today and eternal life. Why is he encouraging them in that? Well, the people in the book of Hebrews were struggling. They were being persecuted. They were going through all sorts of challenges and struggles, so much so that people were falling away from the faith. They were abandoning the faith. They were abandoning the community of the faith because the persecution was so strong. The difficulties they were facing were so serious. And so throughout the book, he keeps encouraging them over and over, cling to your faith, cling to your faith. Christ has done something in you. Don't forget what Christ has done for you. It says, actually, I think it's earlier in this chapter that some people were having their property seized or taken. They were losing their very, their very homes because of their faith in the intention that these Hebrew believers were just encouraged them to hold fast to their faith, to keep going, to remember what Christ has done for them and is doing for them. But also, he makes an appeal, an application every time, several times throughout the book about the community of faith. Let's keep reading. 
Let's read back, uh, let's start back at 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And, verse 24, let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's not the first time he does that. He does that way back in chapter 3, too. When he says, no, cling to your faith, cling to your faith, encourage one another every day as long as it is called today so that you are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Way back in chapter 3, he does this several times in the book. He, he knows they have a problem. He knows they are struggling. He knows they are being persecuted. He encourages them by reminding them who Christ is and what God has done for them. And then the application is always the community of faith cling to the community of faith. And so I want to, once again, as we started, ask why. Why is that always going to be the application here? Why is that always at the end of these, these, these struggles and at the end of these encouragements theologically is part of the answer for them, maintaining their faith in the midst of difficulty, the community of faith. And I would say this, both in this book and the rest of the Bible, that we were created to experience deep, meaningful, Christ-centered community. Let me say that again and put the emphasis in the right part here. That we were created, we were created to experience deep, meaningful, Christ-centered community. And we see this throughout all of Scripture. If I go all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, remember Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 1, it's, it's, it's the explanation of God making all things. And what does it say in Genesis chapter 1 about all the things that God made? It was good. God makes the heavens and the seas, the, the birds and the animals and everything, and it's good and it's good and it's good. And then he makes humans, the man and the woman, and it says it was very good. Tov ma'od, it was very good. And in Genesis chapter 1, there's nothing bad. There's nothing that is not good. Then in Genesis chapter 2, it kind of zooms into the creation of the man and the woman. We find out that the man was created first. And we get to the first thing that is not good in all of creation and all of Scripture. And God looks at the man and he says, It is not good for man to be alone. That's the first not good thing and all of God's creation. So he creates the woman, and they are man and woman companionship. And yes, that passage is about biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. Uh, it is about uh, marriage and who God has designed us to be as men and women together. But it also gets this idea of community and connection. It was not good for man to be alone. Uh, despite all that God created, all the other animals God created, there was nothing that could be God's uh, or be man's companion. He needed another and as all husbands know, man needed a woman. But it's bigger than that. That's just the start of this, 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 this need for deep community in our lives. And in fact, if we are made in the image of God, we need to ask who is our God. And we know our God is Trinity. Our God is one God expressed in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God can't be divided, and yet still express through these three different persons. Uh, we could try to resolve that all day. I'm not doing a sermon on the Trinity, but I did want to say, if we're made in the image of God, no wonder we have this deep-seated need created in us for this community, because the, our God himself has this community built into his oneness and his threeness, the Trinity. And the rest of Scripture also testifies for a need for a community, whether it's in the Old Testament and God's insistence that the people gather together and he brings his people together and he gathers his people together near, from near and far. He brings his people, not just a person or a leader, his people out of Egypt. It's, it's this community that God is constantly bringing together and many of the commands in the Old Testament are how they should live out community together. We talked about this a couple uh, weeks back and we talked about uh, the the Ten Commandments. Most of the Ten Commandments are actually about how to relate to one another. That we shouldn't be jealous or murder one another or steal from one another, right? Those things are, well, they seem very obvious, but they are 
how we're supposed to live life together in the way that God created us to be. The New Testament makes this point even more clear for us. Turn to any epistle, any one of the letters to the churches that you find in the the second half of the New Testament. And in every single one of them, you read about the problems people are, are suffering through. You read about what God has done for us, who God is, what Christ did for us on the cross. And each and every time, just like the book of Hebrews... All the commands are about how to love one another and treat one another. In fact, and I dropped it here earlier today. I don't know where I put it. Oh, here it is. In all of our community group material, we list in the back of the book. This is the book we launch our groups with. Oops. Do we not list it in the back of this book? Oh, okay, there it is. Uh, The one another's of Scripture. Because there's all these commands throughout the New Testament to love one another. So all of the Bible attests to this, that we were created for this need for each other. And I need to say that, uh, and maybe some of you say, well, Shane, that's obvious, but there has been kind of a movement uh, saying that, well, it's, your faith is really more individual, individually practiced. It's about that quiet time in the morning. It's about your time alone with God. Uh, and what that's led to, and I've seen this over the last 10 years, some people saying, well, I don't really need the rest of the church. Like, why can't I just go home with my family and we have our own little private worship session? And that's church from now on. You know, we have each other. But all of Scripture says, no, 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 no. You need more than that, than just your nuclear family. You need a bigger community, or else all these passages would not be here. We need one another. Here's the deal. We can't experience the fullness of what God has for us without some kind of Christ-centered community. We can't. We are designed for it. And if we try to live without that kind of community, what we find is when a difficult time comes, when the challenge hits us, when persecution or just the difficulties of life come, we found, uh uh-oh, we are in trouble if we don't have that kind of community. Many of you know Nicole Keller. She's a member here at Pine Grove. And a couple weeks, or actually I think it was just last week, uh, she had popped in for something, and she said, hey, I, I, the, the tombstone for her husband, Mark, just went into the cemetery over here, and so we walked up and checked it out. Really interesting tombstone. He's got his, uh, uh, it's it, really interesting, a lot of rich symbolism there on it. As we were standing talking about it, she says, you know, I, can't, I am so glad God brought us here. I'm so glad when they moved to this new area where they didn't really know anyone right around here. They lived like a couple miles away. It was shortly after they moved, they they found out how serious Mark's diagnosis was and got the idea that he was not going to survive his cancer. He He had months or a year left, not years. She says, I don't know what we would have done, either Mark or her, during this time of trial, if they hadn't landed at Pine Grove, and just was sharing how God keeps telling her, like, every couple weeks, how he led her to a place where people embraced her, they gave her that community, where Mark had a place to have his faith encouraged during a difficult season. She said, we would not have made it alone. I don't know where I'd be today, and I'm thankful that God led Nicole here, too, because she has been a blessing to so many people, but we need the church We need one another. We were created for Christ-centered community. So if that's true, then we need to then ask ourselves the question, well, what what does it look like to actually live out this community? So let me go back to the passage, read the community section again, and then we'll get an idea what it looks like to actually live this out the way that the writer of Hebrews intended and the way people like Nicole Keller and many of us have experienced deep Christ-centered community in our times of need. Here we go. Uh, Let me read back in verse 24. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's what it looks like to live out Christ-centered community. That when we share our lives together, we encourage one another's faith. That when we share our lives together, we encourage one another's faith. 
That may seem very obvious. Well, yeah, Shane, I get it. Encouragement, hooray. And, but you know what? Encouragement is a deeper and more meaningful word than I think we sometimes give it credit for. Like sometimes we tell our kids, be encouraging and make sure to encourage one another. And we turn it into this light and fluffy word. Uh, maybe we should have uh, translated the word encouragement here, uh, the, the word exhort, as it does in chapter 3. Oh, exhortation, that seems like a serious word. Urgh. But encouragement is so important, which is why when these people are struggling, the author of Hebrews goes to them and says, all right, uh, remember who you are in Christ, and then stir one another up. I love that phrasing, right? Stir one another up for love and good works. Encourage one another all the more as the day draws near. Whenever that day comes, that Christ returns and makes all things new and fixes the mess of this world. But until then, stir one another up for love and good works. Encourage one another. And listen, encouragement is not a light and fluffy word. It is a life-changing word. It makes people do things they would have never done on their own and couldn't do on their own without the encouragement of other people. Uh, let me g- give you an example. In high school, I swam on the swim team, and there was a couple uh, current and former swimmers uh, here today. I was not a swimmer growing up, though. I, I mean, I liked to swim in the pool. I loved the water. I loved the beach. I loved getting crushed by the waves. I had a great time, but I'd never swam on a team until my friend, sophomore year, I wasn't even a freshman, sophomore year invited me on the team. And I joined the team and, and learned how to swim and saw the team grow over the years. By the time I graduated, we had 60 people on the swim team. Now, that might not seem unusual to you, but for a 1,000-person high school in Connecticut, not a lot of big swim teams. All our rival swim teams, they had like 10, 15 people. And then Farmington High School would roll up, boom, 60 people at the swim meet. And the funny thing is, only about 10 to 15 of our swimmers were any good. The rest of us were just, you know, we were okay. I was fine. I was about middle of the road. I was not a great swimmer. Why are all these, like, okay swimmers on this team? Because the environment on this swim team was so encouraging. Uh, Because we had so many people, sometimes they'd have to do entire heats, like entire rounds where it was only Farmington High School swimmers. Like, they wouldn't even be able to score points because the other team didn't have enough people to, to, to run during those heats. It didn't matter. I don't know if you've been in an indoor pool before and know how it echoes. That place was booming. When you dove into the water and and when you first dive in, you're under the water for a couple seconds before you submerge and and take a a breath. And even under the water, you could hear (gasps) vibrating around you as your team was cheering you on. If you were the slowest member on your team, there'd be people by the side, go, 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 keep going. And we loved it, even though some of us were just trying not to drown most of the time. I hope I painted a picture. I like the memories just come flooding back of that room and just the pounding of people's voices for all of us who are not particularly good swimmers. But we were encouraged. We were part of something. We were part of a team. Even though half of us didn't belong anywhere near a pool, it would never score a point for the team. We were part of something bigger. And we poured into each other's lives and we knew each other. Encouragement matters. Encouragement matters. Stir one one another up for love and good works. And we all need that encouragement. But listen, if we want to live that way, here's the hard part. We actually have to know one another. Like, if you don't know what's going on in my life, how could you encourage me besides saying, go get him, Shane. Go get him, Tiger. You got this. I got what? Well, I don't know. You don't know me. I can't encourage you unless I know what's happening in your life. I wouldn't know how to encourage you. I wouldn't know what struggles you're facing, what things you need prayer for, what you need building up, or maybe what needs tearing down in your life. There's no way for me to encourage you unless I know what's happening in your life. And this is where that deep Christ-centered community, and I keep using that phrase over and over again, because just kind of being around each other is no, we actually have to know one another. And sometimes that's the harder, harder part, right? To actually share your life with someone else, to actually open up. 
to actually maybe take off the church smile that we sometimes wear, even in our bad weeks. Be like, actually, I'm not doing great this week. Or, 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 to, or to share the celebrations of life as well. But sometimes we hesitate to really open up our lives. And I think it's because of two expectations that we kind of have in our culture today for men and, and for women. And I think the expectations are in general different. And obviously, it's in general I'm saying here, there's, you know, uh, what you call it's to the rule, exceptions to the rule. But I think for men, sometimes it's hard for us to really share our lives with someone else or really open someone else because of this expectation of self-sufficiency. The expectation is I'm supposed to do this all on my own. I got to tough this out. I just got to, I got to do it on my own. I got it because we are, all of our heroes are self-made men who pulled them up themselves up by their bootstraps and did it on their own. Who are the great heroes in our cultures? These CEOs who built the company up from the ground up with nothing. They started with a shovel and now they're headed into space. That's not actually what happened for any of these guys, but you know, that's the story we love to tell. Who are our heroes in movies and the books we read? These self-made men. And movies like Shane, do you know that Western? I'm, named after, I'm not named after the Western, but I share the name with Shane, this loner who goes in and saves the town and then rides off to the sunset alone, right? Who's we left? Even when I tell people that I learned how to play guitar, they say, oh, did you take lessons? And I said, no, I taught myself. Oh, wow, taught yourself. I'm like, man, I probably should have taken some lessons. I would have gotten better way faster. But we as men have listened to this lie that we are supposed to be self-sufficient. We got it all on our own. Just button it up. I got this. Because the problem is one day we don't got this. And we need each other. For women, I feel like there's a different expectation on them. It's not the expectation of self-sufficiency. Ladies, I think in general, not always, but in general, you're a little better socially than we are. <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, maybe it's just my household, but it's, I think it's true generally. Ladies tend to be a little bit more social. But for women, there's this expectation in our culture of perfection. You're supposed to have it all together, right? You've got to have the perfect household that's perfectly together, and the children are doing fine, everything is good, and you've taken care of everything you're taking care of, and you're working a full-time job, and you're homeschooling, and you're... Wow, it's too much. No one has everything perfect, all assembled, everything together. No one does, all the time. Because of the expectation for perfection, sometimes it is hard for women to really open up even if things are going well, to just share the, the deeper struggles, the things that aren't going well, to share those. And while we don't want to be a people who just sit around complaining to one another, if we don't know what's really happening, if we as men are so concerned about our self-sufficiency, or, if, or, if, or if the women who are believers in this church are so concerned with the, the optics of, of this false perfection, which no one can live out, then we miss being able to really encourage one another and know one another and be able to walk through life together, stirring one another up for love and good works and encouraging one another in the way that we should go because there are days that come when we all need encouragement. I need encouragement. I do. I don't know if you know this, but sometimes even the pastors... <laughs> have a bad week. And I'm thankful that Pine Grove is a church who are encouragers. You know, I keep all the notes that you write me. This stack, and I keep them uh, categorized. Um, this is when my family and I were first moving here. And I had a little box in the back, and you dropped in notes. And I have these paragraphs, this like typewritten note from the Unruhs, of course, with all the information I need to know and, and just this letter of encouragement, people who didn't even know me from the Rissers encouraging us on our move here. It was a big move. It was a scary move. Is, 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 as much as we felt the tug of God in our lives to come here to Pine Grove, and it was clear to us, Woo! it is still scary up and leave friends and
family and a church you know behind the door. Before I made my first official sermon here, I had all these notes of you sharing your life with me, of you encouraging me. And when I have a bad week, and listen, sometimes I have a bad week. It happens. I go to some of these notes. I had a pastor tell me to do this once. And I'm encouraged. And you are still encouraging me, even if you didn't mean to. So, ha! <laughs> we need to encourage one another. So, here's, here's the application. If I could state it in the, in the simplest way uh, possible, it's, it's simply this. To commit. To commit to Christ-centered community, because that's what it's going to take. This stuff is just simply not going to happen on its own. It doesn't happen by mistake. You have to make a commitment. You have to com- make a commitment to be here or a commitment to be at a community group or commit to, even though it's scary, actually open up about that struggle that you need prayer for and you need help with and you need encouragement about. And we do that a couple ways here. We do it through formal processes like our community groups, which uh, we just started a bunch of new groups. It's our small group program, if you don't know here. And if you still want to get involved in community that way, you could always sign up. We'll always, any time of the year, try to connect you to our community groups. We'll usually start a bunch in the fall, kind of reestablish the ones that are already there. Sometimes people do little movement, schedules change, things like that. We'll probably start a couple groups every winter, just as new people come in and, and people's lives change. Summer tends to be kind of a crazy time, but then back in the fall, we'll reestablish those groups. And we want to keep on doing this well into the future. It's like a formal way we do community anyway. And it happens other places too. I know that women's Bible study that meets uh, during the day here, they are experiencing Christ-centered community. It's called a Bible study, and they study the scriptures, but they are there for one another. They share what's happening in each other's lives. They pray for one another. They know what's happening. And it creates the kind of community where people can stir one another up for love and good works and encourage each other as the day draws near. But listen, it doesn't even have to be something formal like this. It could be something informal. I know there's groups of guys that just meet for breakfast. I was so encouraged when I heard that. That's, that's awesome. And they're sharing life together. And sometimes they're just talking about hunting, right? That's all that happens at breakfast. But sometimes they share what's going on with life and are there for each other. They know that they have each other's backs. And there's a group of guys that sometimes meet every once in a while in the evenings too. I don't know if that got started back up again, but it doesn't have to be formal, but we do have things that we set up here to help facilitate the kind of community we talk about here. And you need to commit to it somewhere, whether it's in that informal setting or in the formal setting. It takes a commitment to live life and walk through life one another. It doesn't happen by accident. And let me kind of repeat what Bruce said to to some of you who are watching from home today, I know that since the, uh, as the pandemic went on and people came back, not everyone came back right away. That kind of rhythm of getting up in the morning and and coming to church uh, got interrupted. It's been a little hard to get back. Well, let me reiterate what Bruce said. We miss you. And I want to tell you about our strategy for streaming here going forward. I know I'm coming a little off topic here, but not really. Listen, we're going to keep on streaming, and we want to keep on getting our stream better. We keep wanting to invest in our stream because there's people who here are hearing the gospel, and I've talked to them who would have not heard it otherwise. Sometimes I have no idea how they're watching these sermons, but they are. And then second, we have a lot of people here who can't come to church, and I've told you some of their stories because of health reasons or in their hospital. I know Mary Ellen Winner and, and Cindy Martin and some of the people on our prayer list right now, they can't get here right now. They just can't do it, and they shouldn't do it. They're, they're going through recovery and other different things, but they could take part just a little bit through our stream. So we want to continue streaming, but the stream is not a replacement. It's not a replacement for gathering together and just to kind of bumping into each other like we do on a Sunday morning and say, how's it going? And we say, good. And actually, this thing is happening in my life. Or, hey, I heard about this. How are you doing? And those little touches make such a big difference. If you haven't come back yet, it's time to come back. We miss you. Come on back. It's time. It's time start bumping into each other once again. And if for some reason there's a real reason why you can't be here, come and talk to me. And we'll find a way to help get you connected to Christ-centered community. In a moment, we're going to come before 
the Lord's table here. And we're going to celebrate communion. What I love about communion is it really celebrates two things. It celebrates our connection, our communion with God because of what Christ has done for us. But it also celebrates what God has built here. All of you gathered together from your various backgrounds, from the places you grew up, from the experiences you have, very different from each other. And yet you are all here this morning and we'll all take the bread and the cup representing the blood of Christ and his body that was given for us for our own good. Before we do, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it kind of walks through the Lord's Supper, and it's how we do it today. It's, it, it actually kind of lays out the ceremony of what we do here. But before and after Paul, who's writing to the Corinthians, lays out kind of that ceremony part of it that we iterate over and over again, the passage is really a warning. He says, be careful, don't take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, he says. That's why some of you are sick and dying, because you're taking it in an unworthy manner. Now, I have heard it preached all different ways, what it means to take it as an unworthy manner, but the text makes it very clear. It says that, well, I'll read a little bit of it. Um, Where should I start if I'm going to read some of that? Well... It's, it's a huge passage. Let's, let's, let's not read it right now. But this is what he does say. He says, some of you are getting together and you're starting the supper before everyone gets there. That's not community. That's not community. A thousand years until the late 1800s, the uh, Lord's Supper was done with wine, not grape juice. Uh, and people were getting drunk on the wine before everyone would arrive to do this great celebration together. And he says, that's the infraction of you two ignoring the deep Christ-centered community that God is gathering you together to practice. That's why some of you are sick and dying. That's what it means to, you know, take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. If you are ignoring the community of faith that God has placed you in, if you are having struggles and strife with one another, fix that. Forgive one another and then come to the supper together. So that's what we're going to do in just a minute. I want to invite elders forward who's going to help serve this morning uh, to, to help us do that. Here's how we're going to do it this morning. If you are visiting and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to the table. You don't have to be a member of Pine Grove Church. We believe all believers, uh, all different kinds should be coming forward. We are one body together united in Christ. Uh, and if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we are glad that you are here and hearing the hope that is in Jesus in the community that he is knitting together. We're going to come forward and do that this morning. We're going to have you come through the, through the middle aisles. We're not going to dismiss you by row. Just kind of, you know, get up as you see the row before you kind of clear up. If you need a little extra space, just wait to the end for, to do it at the end. We'll stay here until everyone uh, receives it. And then for some of you should not and cannot get up, I will go around. Just give me a little wave so I can see it, and I will come to you and serve you. Please, if you shouldn't or can't get up, don't we want to serve you and it'll be a blessing to serve you together jim will you pray for the blood or the blood yeah the blood and the body of christ the bread and the cup that we celebrate with this morning okay let us pray